The assault and battery business, into which I was now forced to adventure for a livelihood, was somewhat ill-adapted to the delicate nature of my constitution, but I went to work in it with a good heart, and found my account here, as heretofore, in those stern habits of methodical accuracy which had been thumped into me by that delightful old nurse. I would indeed be the basest of men, not to remember her well in my will. By observing, as I say, the strictest system in all my dealings, and keeping a well-regulated set of books, I was enabled to get over many serious difficulties, and in the end to establish myself very decently in the profession. The truth is that few individuals in any line did a snugger little business than I. I will just copy a page or so out of my day book, and this will save me the necessity of blowing my own trumpet, a contemptible practice of which no high-minded man will be guilty. Now, the day book is a thing that don't lie. January 1st, New Year's Day, met Snap in the street, groggy, mem. He'll do. Met Gruff shortly afterward, blind drunk, mem. He'll answer too. Entered both gentlemen in my ledger and opened a running account with each. January 2nd, saw Snap at the exchange and went up and trod on his toe, doubled his fist and knocked me down. Good. Got up again. Some trifling difficulty with Bag, my attorney. I went. I want the damages at a thousand, but he says that for so simple a knockdown we can't lay them at more than five hundred. Mem must get rid of Bag. No system at all. January 3rd. Went to the theater to look for Gruff. Saw him sitting in a side box in the second tier between a fat lady and a lean one. Quizzed the whole party through an opera glass till I saw the fat lady blush and whisper to G. Went round then into the box and put my nose within reach of his hand. Wouldn't pull it. No go. Blew it and tried again. Not go. No go. Sat, that, sat down then and winked at the lean lady when I had the high satisfaction of finding him lift me up by the nape of the neck and fling me over into the pit, neck dislocated and right leg capitally splintered, went home with high glee, drank a bottle of champagne, and booked the young man for 5,000. Bag says it'll do. February 15th comprised the case of Mr. Snap, amount entered in journal, 50 cents, which C. February 16th cast, that, cast by that ruffian gruff who made me a peasant of $5, made me a present of $5, Cost of suit, $4.25. Net profit, see journal, 75 cents. Now, here is a clear gain in a very brief period of no less than $1.25. This, this is in the mere cases of Snap and Gruff, and I solemnly assure the leader that these extracts are taken at random from my daybook. It's an old saying, and a true one, however, that money is nothing in comparison with health. I found the exactions of the profession somewhat too much for my delicate state of body, and discovering at last that I was knocked all out of shape, so that I didn't know very well what to make of the matter, and so that my friends, when they met me in the street, couldn't tell that I was Peter Prophet at all, it occurred to me that the best expedient I could adopt was to alter my line of business. I turned my attention, therefore, to mud dabbling, and continued it for some years. The worst of this occupation is that too many people take a fancy to it, and the competition is in consequence excessive. Every ignoramus of a fellow who finds that he hasn't brains in sufficient quantity to make his way as a walking advertiser, or an eyesore prig, or a salt and batter man, thinks, of course, that he'll answer very well as a dabbler of mud. But there never was entertained a more erroneous idea than that it requires no brains to mud dabble. Especially, there is nothing to be made in this way without method. I did only a retail business myself, but my old habits of system carried me swimmingly along. I selected my street crossing in the first place with great deliberation, and I never put down a broom in any part of the town but that. I took care, too, to have a nice little puddle at hand, which I could get at in a minute. By these means, I got to be well known as a man to be trusted, and this is one half the battle, let me tell you, in trade. Nobody ever failed to pitch me a copper, and got over my crossing with a clean pair of pantaloons. And as my business habits in this respect were sufficiently understood, I never met with any attempt at imposition. I wouldn't have put up with it if I had. Never imposing upon anyone myself, I suffered no one to play the possum with me. The frauds of the banks, of course, couldn't I couldn't help. Their, their suspension put me... To ruinous inconvenience. These, however, are not individuals but corporations, and corporations 
it is very well known, have neither bodies to be kicked nor souls to be damned. I was making money at this business when, in an evil moment, I was induced to merge in the cur spattering a somewhat analogous but no but by no means so respectable a profession. My location, to be sure, was an excellent one, being central, and I had capital blacking and, bruise, and brushes. My little dog, too, was quite fat and up to all varieties of snuff. He had been in the trade a long time, and I may say understood it. Our general routine was this. Pompey, having rolled himself well in the mud, sat upon end at the shop door until he observed a dandy approaching in bright boots. He then proceeded to meet him and gave the Wellingtons a rub or two with his wool. Then the dandy swore very much and looked about for a boot black. There I was, full in his view, with blacking and brushes. I was, it was only a minute's work, and then came a sixpence. This did moderately well for a time. In fact, I was not avaricious, but my dog was. I allowed him a third of the profit, and he advised, and he was advised to insist upon half. This couldn't stand, so we quarreled and parted. I next tried my hand at the organ grinding for a while, and may, and may say that I made out pretty well. It is a plain, straightforward business that requires no particular abilities. You can get a music mill for a mere song and put it in order. Uh, and to put it in order, you have but to open the works and give them three or four smart raps with a hammer. It improves the tone of the thing for business purposes more than you can imagine. This done, you have only to stroll along with the mill on your back until you see tan bark in the street and a knocker wrapper up in buckskin. Then you stop and grind, looking as if you meant to stop and grind till doomsday. Presently, a window opens and somebody pitches you a sixpence with a request to hush up and go on, etc. I am aware that some grinders have actually afforded to go on for this sum, but for my part I found the necessary outlay of capital too great to permit of my going on under a shilling. At this occupation I did a good deal, but somehow I was not quite satisfied, and so fully abandoned it. The truth is, I labored under the disadvantage of having no monkey, and American streets are so muddy, and a democratic rabble is so obtrusive, and so full of demnition, mischievous little boys. I was now out of employment for some months, but at length succeeded by dint of great interest in procuring a situation in the sham post. The duties here are simple, and not altogether unprofitable. For example, very early in the morning I had to make up my packet of sham letters. Upon the inside of each of these I had to scrawl a few lines on any subject which occurred to me as sufficiently mysterious, signing all the epistles Tom Dobson or Bobby Tompkins or anything in that way, having folded and sealed all and stamped them with sham postmarks, New Orleans, Bengal, Botany, Botany Bay, and or any other place of great a great way off, I set out forthwith upon my daily route, as if in a very great hurry I always called at the big houses to deliver the letters and receive the postage. Nobody hesitates at paying for a letter, especially for a double one. People are such fools, and it was no trouble to get round a corner before there was time to open the epistles. The worst of this profession was that I had to walk so much and so fast and so frequently to vary my route. Besides, I had serious scruples of conscience. I can't bear to hear innocent individuals abused, and the way the whole town took to cursing Tom Dobson and Bobby Tompkins was really awful to hear. I washed my hands of the matter in disgust. My eighth and last speculation has been the cat growing in the cat-growing way. I have found this a most pleasant and lucrative business, and really no trouble at all. The country, it is well known, has become infested with cats, so much so of late that a petition for relief, most numerously and respectably signed, was brought before the legislature at its late memorable session. The assembly, at this epoch, was unusually well informed, and having passed many other wise and wholesome enactments, it crowned all with the Cat Act. In its original form, the, this law offered a premium for cat heads, four pence apiece, but the Senate succeeded in amending the main clause so as to substitute the word tails for heads. This amendment was so obviously proper that the House concurred in concurred it nem con. As soon as the governor had signed the bill, I invested my whole estate in the purchase of toms and tabbies. At first, I could only afford to feed them upon mice, which are cheap, but they fulfilled the scriptural injunction at so marvelous a rate that I at length considered it my best policy to be liberal, and so indulged them in oysters and turtle. 
their tails at a legislative price. Now bring me in a good now bring me in a good income, for I have discovered a way in which, by means of massacre Macassar oil, I can force three crops a year. It delights me to find, too, that the animals soon get accustomed to the thing, and would rather have the appendages cut off than otherwise. I consider myself, therefore, a made man, and am bargaining for a country seat on the Hudson. 